Thank you for downloading this podcast from Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. For more podcasts and more information on your number one news and talk station, please visit 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. Stand up for the law. Stand up for decency. Stand up for compassion. Stand up for respect. Stand up for your community. Stand up for your future. Stand up for South Africa. Lead SA. .co.za The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Clubby. It is 28 minutes to 10 o'clock. Hello, Chris. Good morning. Lovely, lovely to chat to you again. I cannot wait to get into this one. Yesterday, we spoke to uh, somebody from the, the UK. They're selling this boob job cream that is meant to increase the size of your boobs. You just apply it twice a day and uh, that's it then. Is it possible to influence fat cells in the body and achieve these results? To be honest, having not tried the substance, then I would be commenting purely as an external person. And I'm always very skeptical of these kind of products because unless someone can show me clinical published data showing A, how they work, and B, that they're safe, then I'm always a little bit surprised. It's a bit like what pops into my inbox in my uh, email every single day, which is many, many offers for things that work apparently the same way as Viagra, but are 100% natural. Mm. And creams that you can apply, which suddenly make things grow down there by about 100% in five weeks and all this kind of stuff. I, I am a little bit sceptical. Um, the company are also selling the same thing in the UK. Mm. Uh, until I've tried it and I've seen clinical data where someone actually does a, a proper blind trial, and I don't know if they've done that. I can't. I've just been having a look on their website to see if they've actually got some published data showing this. Um, then, then I can't really comment because mm. if you if you were a drug company who was going to say, I've got this anti-cancer remedy, People would quite rightly ask, well, what's the evidence that if I pay this money for this remedy, it's going to cure me? And the evidence that people would want to see is a blind trial. In other mm. words, you would take a group of people, you would randomly assign them to receive the, the chemical or a placebo. Mm. You would then ask someone to assess them who doesn't know what treatment they're getting and then ask those people, apply the cream that you don't know what it is for X amount of time, and the person who's assessing them that doesn't know what treatment they're on then records impartially whether or not there's been a response. Mm. Uh, I haven't seen that kind of data for this product. They may well be sitting on it, but I haven't seen it, and therefore you, you are always very sceptical. And it might be worth, if anyone's contemplating investing in some of this stuff, to actually ask the company those questions. Because if they're a good company and it's a good, solid product with a good, solid scientific evidence behind it, then they'll have that data, they can give it to you, and at the price tag they're asking, I don't think that's an unreasonable request for people to ask. Mm -hmm. But just generally, I mean, how do fat cells uh, behave? I understand that not all fat cells are equal and they behave differently in different parts of the body. Can you tell us about that? Yes, well, it's interesting that, that you've asked about this product today because there is also this week a, a study which has been published from America. It's actually a guy called Michael Jensen who's at the Mayo Clinic in America. And he was interested in the claim that's been around for a very long time, actually, that the fat cells that you're born with, once you get beyond about the age of 11 or 12, you don't make any more of them. You just make the ones that you've got bigger if you gain any weight. So to investigate this claim, they recruited 28 healthy men and women who were not overweight, they had a BMI, a body mass index of less than 26, and they put them on an eight-week overfeeding trial. Mm. Um, it sounds like a glutton's heaven, actually. It All does. they did was to, to take, the, take what they should be eating and then double it. <laughs> and they were feeding them ice cream and chocolate bars and things. Whoa. So that the average weight gain for the average person in the study was four kilos in two months. So the, the people all gained four kilos. And what they were interested in doing was comparing how the fat in different parts of the body responded to this weight gain. And a really interesting result emerged because when they compared the fat around the middle, around the abdomen, they found that the fat there got bigger, the cells enlarged, but they didn't increase in number. Right. So that kind of agrees with the old claim. But then they took samples of fat from the thighs and the bum area, and they found that the average size of the fat cells had gone down. Now, the only way that could happen is if the number of cells has actually increased. In fact, they found that the average person in the study, uh, by gaining four kilos, added 2.5 billion new fat cells around their bums. Mm. So, therefore, you can make new fat, and different parts of the body have fat cells that behave differently. Mm. 
And this is important because we know that if you look at people who have different body shapes, they have different risks of heart disease and high blood pressure and diabetes. So people mm. that are said to be apple shape, where they put all the weight on around the middle and have a beer gut, that carries a much greater risk of heart disease than someone who is the same weight but has got a, a much more preferential waist-to-hip ratio. In other words, they've put all of the weight on around their bum and thighs. The people in this latter case are at much lower risk of having heart disease. So clearly there's something interesting going on with the way the fat works in these different areas. And one theory they put forward is that maybe by increasing the number of fat cells around your thighs, what you actually do is put the fat there rather than around your middle. And this is a protective mechanism to stop you gaining too much weight in that region. But fat is therefore an unknown entity. Mm. It's an, at the moment something that needs a lot of research because of the clinical impact. And if you look at diabetes, there are millions of people around the world with diabetes, which carries a huge risk of things like heart disease and stroke. And it's all linked to obesity and having too much fat around your middle. So understanding this is really important if we're mm. to stop people getting a, a very serious and very expensive to treat chronic illness in their older age. Okay. And here's one that I really, really like, Chris. Uh, it's wonderful when you're told, oh, you're glowing. So men perspire, women glow. I like that. Yeah, I was trying to find the origin of that claim because it said horses sweat, men perspire, women only glow mm -hmm. and I can't find a reference for it going back earlier than the 1950s so if anyone knows where this saying came from I'd be really interested to know but everyone's heard it um, but what does it mean well it's true it turns out there's a group of researchers in Japan this is Yoshimoto Inoue who's at uh, the Osaka International University and they wanted to investigate the difference in sweating rates between men and women so what they did was to recruit a big group of uh, I mean, well, 37 actually, trained and untrained men and women. So in other words, people that were fit and took regular exercise and another bunch of people who were a bit couch potato-esque. Mm. And they subjected them to an hour-long regimen of exercise which saw them exercising at increasingly intense levels between 30% and a maximum of 60% of what they would be capable of. And they measured on these people how much sweat they were making and how many sweat glands they had active. And another interesting result emerged because what they found is that men make much more sweat than women do mm. and that training increases your rate of sweating. So if you train and become fit, actually your sweating becomes much more efficient. You sweat sooner at a lower temperature, but women are always lagging behind the men. Women can never sweat as much as men do. And so you ask, well, why should that be? Mm. And the researchers put forward the theory that actually women have as a percentage of their body mass a much lower percentage of water, and therefore water is more precious to women than it is to men. So it kind of fits from an evolutionary point of view that men should therefore, given their role in being um, bigger and bulkier, have a better tolerance for exercise because they have more water so they can sweat sooner mm -hmm. and therefore they can do more hard work, whereas women have to be a bit more cautious and they're less labour uh, enabled, let's say. Um, or activity enabled at high temperature when they're, when they're under temperature challenge. So it does kind of fit with, with what we understand evolutionarily. Mm -hmm. And I understand now that the, the team that did this research is now planning to look at how hormones themselves influence this process. Yes, because one of the things that seems to Im impact on the number of active sweat glands and how quickly they turn on is testosterone, the male hormone. And taking exercise and being fit and trained increases testosterone levels. And so that would suggest that's the mechanism by which the sweating is boosted. But because men have much higher testosterone levels than women do, this would explain why women don't sweat as efficiently or as much as men ever do, uh, which many wives will tell you they knew that already anyway. <laughs> All right, let's get the calls now on 021-446-0567-011-883-0702. Judy in Rodiport, good morning. Yes, hi, Reedy. Hi, mm. Naked Scientist. I have got quadruplets, and at the moment they are multiplying, which is wonderful. I've got one little granddaughter, and I'm expecting two more next year. Now, the interesting fact of that is that um, our little granddaughter was born in April this year, and our two new ones are going to born, be born in April next year. And what I want to know is, um, apparently, the, the, the two who are being born now in, in April, um, they're both having boys. And I just find that fascinating that 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 this is 
actually happening. Um, the, the one who's having a boy is quadruplet number one and quadruplet number four. And quadruplet number two had a girl. And I just wonder what, whether quadruplet number three, when she's ready to have her family, whether she will also have a girl, whether, I don't know how it works. Well, congratulations, Judy. You're managing to produce <laughs> some fertile <laughs> offspring. That's wonderful. Were they, were they conceived, these octuplets, entirely naturally? No. Or did you have some fertility help? I had fertility. Ju yes, because when you have fertility treatment, various drugs are given to encourage the ovary to produce more eggs because normally what happens in the average cycle is that lots and lots of eggs are initiated in the ovary by hormones from the pituitary gland up in your head and these eggs begin to grow until lots of them are developing side by side and they're producing lots of estrogen to get the over the, the uterus ready to receive a possible embryo but then all of a sudden one and in rare cases two of these follicles as they're known overtake the others and grow more the other ones regress and you then get one egg and sometimes two eggs being popped out of the ovary mm -hmm. that's the normal process but if you give drugs to help with fertility more of those follicles develop more of them ovulate spit out an egg and therefore you have several eggs floating down the fallopian tubes at once and they can end up being fertilized or if you have lots of embryos collected sorry lots of eggs collected from the ovary and fertilized in a dish and then put back because you want you don't want to put one back and then have to go again and try and put another one back you put a few back to see uh, which ones are going to take you can get multiple pregnancies Mm. And as far as we know, and in fact the, the guy who actually made it all possible with the first test tube baby, he actually died this week. Um, so there was a big, sorry, sorry, Nobel Prize mm. this mm. week. So there's a big celebration around this. Um, but the point is that as far as we know, people who are born via this route have long, healthy and happy lives. And there doesn't seem to be any impact on them. And what you're seeing now is the impact probably of chance on your children. Because there's a 50% chance of having a boy, there's a 50% chance of mm -hmm. having a girl. Absolutely. And so what you're seeing is, is natural variation, but you're attaching significance to it because there's a coincidence there. Because whenever we, um, well, as, as humans, we're programmed to spot relationships. Yes. And we're, we're programmed, we've evolved to spot patterns. And sometimes we can be fooled into thinking there is a pattern, even though it's just a natural bit of variation mm. and it's a bit like someone asked me the other day when i was actually in joburg and, and said what if i dream something and then a few days later that really happens yeah, what's the chances yeah. of that happening i said well it's actually really really likely because there's 6.8 billion people on earth they're all dreaming every night in fact they're probably having 10 dreams every night so that's sort of 68 billion <laughs> dreams every night and there's going to be a few times where people are thinking about things that are important to them or worrying about things that are going to happen downstream and they're going to dream about the thing which is likely to come true in a number of cases. So it's not sure. so unusual. And I, th I think what you're seeing is, is natural variation. Congratulations. Sounds wonderful. It does indeed. And Chris, you're reminding me of what a friend of mine who was pregnant three years ago used to say. She wanted to keep the gender of the baby a secret. And people would ask, are you having a girl or a boy? And she'd say, you know what? Uh, it's either a girl or a boy. You can only have either or. or you know. <laughs> so it will be a girl or a boy. It's like we had a, a person on the television here who used to make predictions, you know, one of these astrology people, make predictions using stars and stuff about uh, the National Lottery. And uh, people used to take the rip out of it in other comedy programs and they'd say, this week's winner will be a man or a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then someone actually wrote into a magazine that I used to read and it said... Uh, I was at a party and this woman came up to me and said, can I have a cigarette? And they said, but I don't smoke. But then if she was any good at her job, she should know that, shouldn't she? <laughs> All right, let's go to Albert in Isendo. Hi. Hi. Mm. Okay. Albert, ask your question. In an AC coil, the iron core is pulled inwards and an aluminium core is pushed outwards. Why? Hello, Albert. Um, the, the reason for uh, these effects, if you've got an electric coil, then what you're getting with a magnet, so if you pass electricity through a coil of wire, you get an, a magnetic flux around the wire. And if you have uh, lots of wire and an iron core, then that magnetic flux passes into the iron core and the iron becomes part of the magnet. That's an electromagnet. 
If you have a non-ferrous material, for instance a disc of aluminium, and you spin your disc of aluminium inside your magnetic field, what you do is to induce in the magnetic field a current that's passing in the aluminium. That current then produces a magnetic field around the current that's spinning in the, in, the, in the aluminium, and that magnetic field is in the opposite direction to the magnetic field of the magnet, and so the two oppose each other, and the, ma and the aluminium moves away. And this is actually how electromagnetic braking works. So you'd have an aluminium disc, for example, spinning inside a, a, a mag changing magnetic field, and you make this back EMF, as it's called, which has uh, its own a magnetic field in opposition to the original magnetic field and it will push the two apart. So um, that's the reason. Okay, thank you very much for your question, Albert. Let's go to Marlene in Benmore. Hi. Hello. Yes. Um, I'd like to know about emphysema. I believe there is no cure. Uh, do you think there would be anything on the horizon? Do you think one day there might be a cure? Okay. Hello, Marlene. Um, well, first of all, what is emphysema? And emphysema is where you have damage to lung tissue, where the alveoli, the tiny air sacs and the bottom reaches of the lungs, have merged. Instead of being lots of tiny air sacs, the walls between them break down and you get big air sacs. And why this is a problem is that the way the lung works is by bringing gas into contact with the blood. And this happens in thin, tiny blood vessels which run through the walls of those air sacs. And the way of getting the most gas in contact with the most blood is to have the biggest surface area to volume ratio. If you have a small sphere, a small air sac, then most of the surface of that sphere is in contact with blood and only a small amount of the volume, the gas in the middle, isn't in contact with the wall of the, the air sac. If you make a much bigger air sac by merging two adjacent ones together because they break down, what you end up with is a much much less propitious surface area to volume ratio. So the volume is much higher now and the amount of surface area in contact with the blood is much lower. As a result, gas exchange in the lung is impaired. So it's harder for the oxygen to move out of the breathed in air and get into the blood. And it's harder for carbon dioxide in the blood to get out of the blood and back into that airspace for you to breathe it out. So people who have got progressive lung damage caused actually most frequently by smoking, but other things will do it too. There are some genetic causes for getting emphysema. One could alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, and various industrial things can cause lung damage like this too. This tends to be progressive and irreversible. So if you've lost the lung tissue, mm. you can't get it back, and therefore you suffer uh, a reduction in lung function. This may not necessarily impact on people that much. depends on what sort of job they do if and what sort of life they lead. But loss of lung tissue means loss of lung tissue. So the only way to cure this problem would be to reverse the process. That is probably too much of a tall order, but what scientists are doing is looking at how we can grow new lung tissue, completely new lung tissue, from a patient's own stem cells. So maybe in 10, 15 years, it will be possible to grow new lung tissue from a person's own tissue and then make a new surrogate implantable lung lobe that could be put in inside the chest mm -hmm. to replace the damaged tissue instead. Okay, thank you very much for your question there. I have an SMS, uh, Chris. It says medication dosage is always the same, regardless of body size. How does this affect the patient, especially with over-the-counter medicine? Well, it's a very good point. And yes, for some drugs, you do need the right dose to be tailored to your volume of distribution. So if you have a very large body size, you would need a larger dose relative to someone who is much smaller. But some agents, you don't need to do that because some drugs work with such high affinity. In other words, they are, they are very good at hitting their target that actually even if you put just a small amount of them in to a very big person, they're still going to lock on to the target thing very, very well. So it's not necessarily always the case, but that is a good point. And most drugs that are served up over the counter what they have is what's called a very wide therapeutic index. In other words, the difference between the therapeutic level of drug and the dangerous level of drug is very, very broad. So you'd have to take an enormous amount extra of the drug in order to have bad effects. Mm. This is a sort of general rule of thumb, so you know, don't go and experiment. But the point is that you can take a fairly hefty dose to make sure that you're giving people enough without actually poisoning them. And this means the dosages that are set 
mm. for over-the-counter medicines usually are set somewhere in the middle of that range so that if someone is very, very small, yes, they might be getting a fairly big dose for them, but it's still not a toxic dose, oh, whilst okay. people who are a bit smaller are getting, a bit bigger, are getting a relatively smaller dose, but it's still a therapeutic one because it's above the cut-off line of mm. this drug will work, but it's still obviously, again, well short of where the drug becomes toxic. Mm. When it becomes a problem is in hospital, and if you've got someone who has got um, an infection or something and needs certain antibiotics that are given intravenously at very high dose, then your pharmacist is going to start weighing patients and they're going to start looking at how their kidneys work because many drugs are excreted by the kidneys into urine um, and if your kidneys aren't working very well then you have to adjust the dosages but th usually for things you buy over the counter they're safe to sell over the counter because they have this very broad therapeutic index where you'd have to seriously overdose to put yourself into the toxic area Okay, very, very interesting question there Nicholas and Rodi Puertai Hi, Rudy. Hi, Chris I've got a question regarding preservation of matter so so here's my question. At the rate that we are currently consuming and burning fossil fuels in the form of oil and coal, are we not decreasing the mass of the Earth in such a way that it will alter its orbit around the sun and therefore have uh, devastating consequences on the, uh, on, uh, on the weather and everything that we know as to be living? Or is that negated by all the other living things that come up and by trees growing and grass growing, all those types of things? How does that work? Hello, Nicholas. Well, the answer is that the Earth isn't changing its mass at all by you putting some fuel in your car and driving down the road because the fuel that you're burning has come out of the ground, initially in the form of crude oil, which has been refined to make um, lighter distillate, which you then put into your car. But when you burn that fuel, the atoms that are in there, carbon, because it's a hydrocarbon, there'll be lots of carbon atoms linked together to form hydrocarbons, they will be burned in oxygen coming from the atmosphere of the earth and they will then chuck out co2 and water carbon dioxide and water along the exhaust pipe into the earth's atmosphere well the earth's atmosphere is not going to go away so all you've done is take the mass which was distributed inside the earth under its surface as fossil fuels and add the same mass into the atmosphere because atoms all weigh something and uh, you can't destroy the atoms unless you've got some kind of nuclear reactor, which unless you've got a very fast car <laughs> from the future, you're not going to have. So basically the atmosphere is going to weigh a bit more and the Earth's surface is going to weigh slightly less. But in the grand scheme of things, relative to the mass of the whole planet and the planet plus its atmosphere, we're actually making a very tiny difference. Compositionally, we're making a big difference. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up by over 30% in the last 200 years, which for, a, for an animal to change the composition of the atmosphere gas of a whole planet by 30 percent in 200 years is quite an achievement mm. that we've managed there but the actual bottom line is the mass of the planet as a system isn't really changing um it, there's a little bit of debris raining in from space 40 to 100 thousand tons of space dust lands on earth every year um, which means the planet gains weight a little bit for that reason but burning fossil fuels does not result in a net change in the mass of the planet kevin in bedford view hi Hi, morning. How are you? Fine, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I need to ask a, an interesting question, and that is why I've managed to get a fluffy in my belly button at the end of every day. I tell my children it's a bit of magic, but they find it most hilarious. <laughs> Hello, Kevin. Um, I have a good friend in Australia called Dr. Carl, um, who actually got an Ig Nobel Prize for doing a big study on belly button fluff across Australia oh. and invited people to send in samples of their belly button fluff because his hypothesis was it is always blue. So is your belly button fluff always blue? Is it, Kevin? Is it always blue? Okay, Kevin is still thinking. He's gone. Um, but the point is, you have this belly button, which is a little recess down over the tummy area, so it's a perfect hole to catch stuff. And if you look at the clothing we wear, it's always shedding lint. If you look at the lint, the little particles of fabric that collect in the washing machine or in the, dis in the tumble dryer, they're always a sort of grey-blue colour. And this is because once you've added together all the different colours of all the different fibres that we wear, um, the average colour is this grey-blue. 
and when you wear clothing, bits fall off of it and they look to fall downwards inside your clothing and they fall into this little hole. And if you've got an innie rather than an outy belly button, you've got a little useful <laughs> receptacle for them to fall into and, this, and a little bit of sweat goes in there as well and this helps to stick it all together. So you will get belly button fluff because you have this, this nice hole <laughs> where it just all falls into. I just think this discussion is disgusting, Chris. We should have the South African equivalent of, of the belly button fluff study and get people to send in to 702 um, no, they all can samples send them of their belly you. button fluff <laughs> and, and we'll see what colour people make of belly button fluff in South Africa. Yuck, Chris, I'll chat to you next week. <laughs> Address them personally for, for reading. <laughs> oh, no.